I've been uh, reading about William and Caroline Herschel for a long time, and it just seemed to me that they called out to be better recognized than they are in this modern world. And so that's why I tried to write a play about them. But I wanted this evening to do more than just talk about a play or just talk about them. So that's why I'm particularly grateful to Steve Fitzpatrick and to Biz Lyon for their work in making them come to life. Uh, Biz will be playing the part of Caroline Herschel. Steve will be William Herschel. And later in the play, two other parts, the part of Lord Storker and John Herschel. The play is called Little Lessons for Lina. Uh, and these are, this is not the whole play, these are excerpts. The play begins in 1840 with Caroline Herschel, now an old woman, but she's going to become a young girl pretty soon. She has returned to her birthplace in Hanover, Germany. Pretend that you, the audience, have just given Caroline an award, one of many that she has received. to Caroline Herschel for extraordinary service to astronomy. Really, it is to my brother William that all these honors are due. I just tried to help him however I could. But it was so little. I was not educated to be an astronomer, nor could I educate myself as he did. I was scarcely educated at all. I just tried to be useful. You see, I never forgot the caution my dear father gave me against all thought of marriage saying as I was neither handsome nor rich, it was not likely that anyone would propose to me till perhaps late in life, some old man might take me for my good qualities. He was right. Till then, I could perhaps make myself useful, have a career of my own. What I wanted most was a career in music. Her father was a musician. Her four brothers were musicians. The two oldest, Jacob and Wilhelm, had fled to England during the Seven Years' War. Wilhelm had found success in England and was now music impresario of the resort town of Bath. When Caroline was 17, she wrote a letter to Wilhelm and had some sad news. Oh, Wilhelm, my father has died. Such a good man is gone. Gone forever now are the music lessons father gave me when mother wasn't watching. Mother didn't like Papa teaching you boys anything but music, and she didn't like him teaching me anything at all. We were the servant class, she said. To aspire for more would only bring unhappiness. You were gone to England, but Papa took me walking in the hills and taught me to identify plants and rocks and animals, and at night he would point out the stars. Papa wanted me to have French lessons. With French, I could have earned my own living as a governess, but Mother refused to allow it. She didn't want me to leave home. I was her servant. So now I have become a household drudge for her and for our brother Jacob, too. He's the oldest brother, so he is head of household now and has the power to do whatever he wants. Dear Caroline, I think of our father often. I wish your life were better, especially when I think of mine. Oh, Lina, how fortunate I am. I have a comfortable position in England. I like it here so much, I have even made my name English. Instead of Wilhelm, I am now William. Here in Bath, I am an organist for the Octagon Chapel and a musician, conductor, composer, and teacher for musical activities everywhere in this most musical of cities. Our brother Alexander tells me you are musical too, that you have a good voice. Bravo, dear sister. Our brother Jacob arrived safely back in Hanover. Thanks to the concerts you arranged for him in Bath, he now has some money. But all that money is spent for his comfort, his entertainment. He acts like a prince and demands that mother and I sew him fancy clothes and serve him the English food he has grown used to. He yells at mother when he is not satisfied, and he is never satisfied. Mother would yell back at him, except that he is now head of our family, so she can't. She yells at me instead. Yesterday, Jacob thought I was awkward in serving him dinner, so he took up a stick and whipped me, his own sister. And this was not the first time. It is just the worst yet. 
Dear sister, I have an idea that may bring an end to your drudgery, or should I say slavery. I will be writing a letter to Mother and Jacob. William Herschel returned to Hanover when Jacob was away and gave his mother enough money to hire a servant for the rest of her life. So Mother doesn't need me anymore. Lina, would you like to come to England with me? I will train you to be a singer. I was free. I felt like Cinderella. And off I rode in a carriage with William. Off to live in a new land, England, with a new language, English, and to prepare for a new occupation, singing. I did not know that it would be more than 50 years before I would return to my homeland. On the way to the coast, William and I traveled six days and six nights in an open coach. Along the way, William pointed out the stars and constellations to me, just as father had done. Crossing the North Sea, a storm tossed our boat up and down. I was so sick, but at last we reached London. I thought we would stop to see the sights and attend some concerts. I hoped William would buy me some clothes for my new life as a singer, but we only stayed one night. Mostly we visited optical shops. William did not wear glasses. Why did he visit optical shops? We reached Bath after 12 days of travel with only two nights in a bed. I slept for more than 24 hours. When I woke up, I found that William had worked straight through without any rest. He woke me for breakfast at seven and began immediately to give me lessons in English and mathematics and bookkeeping. And now, Caroline, it's time for your first singing lesson. Pick up the composition that I've written for you. Now, open your mouth wide. <laughs> now leave it in. You must practice singing with a handkerchief in your mouth. It will improve your projection and enunciation. Good, 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 good. Now, from the top. Yes, well, yeah. There's a lot to work on. But the bath concert season does not begin till October, so we have time. And so my training began. Every morning I was to be up at 7 o'clock, before 7 o'clock, much too early for me. But William was up even earlier, for every day on the breakfast table there was always a note from him marked, Little Lessons for Lina. The little lessons were mathematics problems for me to solve and discuss with him over breakfast. I didn't know any arithmetic. German schools didn't teach math to girls. Following breakfast I took cooking lessons from the housekeeper, then followed a lesson in speaking and writing English, and then another in math emphasizing bookkeeping. Next, I practiced music, playing the harpsichord and singing with a gag in my mouth. Finally, William allowed me some relaxation, by which he meant reading books on astronomy and optics. That was my daily schedule up till noon. Good, Caroline. William said I was making good progress. Good. Except for my father. I don't remember anyone in my family ever saying good and Caroline in the same sentence before. Mm -hmm. But progress was slow because William was so busy composing, rehearsing, arranging concerts, performing, teaching students. At night, William needed to relax. He would sit in bed and read. He started by reading about harmonics to help, that helped him with music theory and composing. Harmonics led him to mathematics. He would relax by solving calculus problems. Mathematics led him to optics. Optics led him to astronomy. He would fall asleep buried under his favorite authors. What better way to refresh the mind than to contemplate the majesty of the heavens? Don't you ever wonder about the structure of the universe? You mean the planets? They move like clockwork among the background stars. How they move is already known, you told me, thanks to Newton. No, not that. I mean the stars themselves. How far away they are, how they're organized, how did they form? Do they change? Well, what do all your new books say? Well, What's that's, the answer? That's the problem, Lina. They don't say anything. They spend maybe 20 chapters on the motion of the sun, moon, and planets, and only one <coughs> chapter on the stars. And that chapter says nothing. Nothing about what the stars are, or how distant they are, or how they're arranged. The stars are just assumed to be an unchanging background. Well, if that's what the great scholars at Oxford and Cambridge say, that must be the way it is. Well, that's what they say because they can't see very well. Their telescopes are small. 
The stars are very far away. To understand the stars will require larger telescopes. I must build a telescope that is bigger, one that can gather more light. I must see for myself. I must break through the depths of the cosmos. That's all very nice, William, but you're a musician. And I'm trying to mu be a musician, a singer, with your help, William. I worked hard on my singing, but I despaired that I would ever have a career because my brother had so little time to give me lessons. Yet, he must have felt I was improving because he invited Bath's most feared singing critics over to hear me practice the songs so that I would not sound German. And such refined and superior ladies they were. I could not tolerate them. Mr. Herschel! Your sister is much improved. You are much improved, Lionel. Well, how nice it is to be improved. <laughs> <laughs> William gave me 10 pounds to buy clothes suitable for the concert stage. It was the first time I had ever gone to a store and bought a dress. I did not spend that much, of course, but I guess I did all right because the theater owner said I was an ornament to the stage. No one had ever said I looked nice before. And it was even nicer when the Duchess of Lothian and others said that I had sung beautifully. After five years of lessons, that was my first performance as a soloist. I was 27 years old. The next year, William made me soprano soloist for the whole concert season, including Handel's Messiah. A visiting concert director liked my voice so well that he offered me an engagement in Birmingham. I said no, of course, because I would not sing unless my brother was the conductor. And then, before I knew it, my singing career began to slip away. It was banishing. Ever since he came to Bath, William had been working 18 hours a day with his rehearsals and concerts and composing and music students. And then, to my horror, he started building telescopes. Our beautiful home was transformed into a factory. William turned almost every room into a workshop, one for building telescope stands, another for grinding eyepiece lenses and eyepiece holders, Splinters of glass and wood everywhere. I was put to work making tubes for the telescopes. I had to help William so he would have enough time left to teach me. Soon William's telescopes and telescope making machines spilled over into the studio where he taught his students. It's shameful. What are your students to think? Some of my students have asked me to teach them astronomy instead of music. But William, this is Bath, the city of music. This isn't Oxford or Cambridge. You are ruining your musical career and mine. You are ruining your house. In the basement of our house, William set up a furnace to melt the metal for the telescope mirrors. When he was giving a music lesson, he would sometimes excuse himself so that he could rush downstairs to pour the molten metal into a form to cool. <laughs> William, what is that stench? It's just horse manure. Well, the whole house, your music studio, it smells like a stable. But horse dung makes a perfect mold for my telescope mirrors. Soon I was pounding horse dung into molds for telescope mirrors. And then it got worse. William found that a mirror was better if once you began polishing, you don't stop. And now the mirrors were bigger so that William had to polish continuously for up to 16 hours at a time. His hands and arms and body were in motion every second. He would not stop to eat or drink. So to keep him alive, I would cut up his food stand alongside aside him, and timing it just right, I'd put bits of food in his mouth so that he wouldn't have to stop working. Mm. William started with a telescope seven feet long. Then he built a 10 foot, and then a 20 foot, at first with a 12 inch mirror. It was a huge monster, half the height of our house. To observe at the eyepiece, William had to climb a giant step ladder. He was sometimes 20 feet above the ground. One night while he was observing, he took a wrong step the stepladder collapsed and he was almost killed. In a few days, he had rebuilt the giant stepladder and resumed observing. His fall didn't seem to bother him, but it bothered me. So whenever I could stay awake, I stayed up with him at night to make sure he watched his step. Caroline, come look. I have a surprise for you. I was looking at some stars in the constellation Taurus when I saw a most curious object. Here, see for yourself. That faint object? It isn't a pinpoint of light like the stars. But how can that be? The objects that look like tiny balls are planets, but we know all the planets. Saturn is farthest from the sun, and it's never that small and dim. 
So what are we to make of it? I don't know. Might it be a comet? Yes, a comet. But, but there's no tail. Sometimes comets don't have tails. At least none that we can see. What about its ball-like appearance? Yes, it could be a comet. The head of a comet often looks like a disk. So it's a comet? What else could it be? Well, it doesn't look quite right to be a comet. The entire disk is shining evenly. The comets you've shown me had heads that were bright in the center and dim and fuzzy at the edges. Exactly. Here. These are drawings people have made of comets. Well, this object is different. And this object has moved since I found it Monday. Just a little. Yet it's enough to see that it's moving against the same background of stars that the planets are traveling. The zodiac. But it's moving slower than Saturn. Jupiter travels slower than Mars because it's farther from the sun than Mars. Saturn travels slower than Jupiter because it's farther from the sun than Jupiter. And this object is moving, but it's traveling slower than Saturn, so... So? So it's farther from the sun than Saturn? Yet, it may be going around the sun in an orbit like a planet. Has anyone ever seen a comet traveling so slowly, a, a comet that seems to be so far away? No, not that I know of. So what are you going to do? I've done it already. I've sent a message to the Royal Society in London. Mm -hmm. I've told them that it is probably a comet and where to look. I'm an amateur, so some of them are professional astronomers. They'll figure it out. Two weeks later, William got a letter from Neville Maskelyne, the Astronomer Royal. He said he had a devil of a time finding William's comet, or whatever it was. William with his telescope could see the object as a disk. The Astronomer Royal with his royal telescopes couldn't. After several nights, the Astronomer Royal finally found the object because it changed its position very slightly from one night to the next. He still couldn't see it as a disk, but from the motion that William had reported and from the motion he himself had seen, he said, I think it more likely that what you have discovered is a planet, a planet, not a comet, a new planet that had never been noticed before. And so it was. William had found the first planet to be discovered in recorded history. All the other planets were discovered so long ago there was no writing to record it. Caroline, it seems I have discovered a new planet. The Royal Society sends its congratulations. King George sends his congratulations also and asks that I come to Windsor Castle and demonstrate my telescope for him. But first I am to take my telescope to Greenwich the Royal Observatory, so that the Astronomer Royale can inspect my telescope and see the new planet with it. My brother wrote to me from the Royal Observatory at Greenwich. Little Lina, these last few nights I have been stargazing at Greenwich with, can you imagine, Dr. Neville Maskeline, the Astronomer Royale, and Alexander Aubert, one of our nation's greatest observers. <laughs> they have compared their telescopes to mine in Caroline. <laughs> they have found mine superior to any at the Royal Observatory and to any they know of. Double stars like Polaris that they could not see with their instruments. I could show with my telescope very plainly among opticians and astronomers, nothing is talked about except what they call my great discoveries. Alas, this shows how far they are behind. With, with such trifles as I have been, seen and done are called great. I cannot wait to get home and get back to work. I will make such telescopes and I will see such things none of us can imagine. When William returned from Windsor, I was practicing my music. Caroline, his majesty has offered to make me his special astronomer to the king and give me 20 pounds a year for the rest of my life. What? Astronomy is your hobby. You are a musician. 200 pounds a year, that is only half of what you're earning from your music. Yes, but it's worth it. I mean, no more half-hearted students to teach. 
No more aristocrats who go to concerts to be seen and not to listen. I can devote all my time to astronomy. But, William, what will happen? Yes, you're right. I must show my gratitude to King George. My friends in the Royal Society say that I should name the planet the Georgium Cytus. <laughs> but William, you discovered the new planet. The planet should have your name. The king had nothing to do with finding it. Already many people are calling it Planet Herschel. Well, some astronomers in Europe say the planet should have the name of a Roman god just as other planets do. They say the new planet should be called Uranus. But, you know, in mythology, Uranus was the father of Saturn. I don't care what people call it. I only want to get on with my astronomy, and the king has made that possible. So the new planet is Georgia's star, the Georgian planet. I'm grateful. <laughs> oh, yes, there's one more thing. I must move from Bath to near Windsor Castle and be available when the king wants to show the royal family and his visitors the sights in the sky. That's all. That's all the work I have to do. I am free to spend all of the rest of my time doing scientific research, anything I want. But how will you live on half the money you earn now? I will build telescopes during the day and sell them. Already I'm getting letters from observatories in England and Europe asking me to make them a telescope and name my own price, whatever price I want to charge. But, William, what will happen to me? What do you mean? Well, of course you will come with me to Windsor and manage the household just as you have always done here in Bath. And you will help me with my observations and copy out my papers and... Well, my career as a singer. You brought me to Bath to train me as a singer. You made me a soloist and then you're featured soloist. And all that time I was managing your household and helping you grind telescope mirrors and helping you with observations and calculations, not having enough time for my music, my chance at a career, my chance of having money of my own so I wouldn't be a burden to you or anyone else in the family. But Caroline, I have a thousand ideas. Things in astronomy that people have never thought to do. Already I've built telescopes that are creating a revolution in the field. I know how to build still larger instruments to see what the nebulas are, to see the structure of the universe, to see if objects in the universe change as time passes. No one has done these things before. Now I can. I must. But what of me, William? What of me? I cannot do it without you, Caroline. I want to be a singer. You wouldn't have chosen me as a featured soloist in Handel's Messiah if you didn't think I was good enough to be a professional. In astronomy, I, I'm hardly a, an apprentice. My only value is that I'm available and cheap. And so am I, Lina. Cheap. That's what my friends say. Yes. You've named a planet after the king. You have immortalized him, and the king is giving you a paltry 200 pounds a year. Here in Bath, music pays you double that amount. No monarch has ever bought so much honor for himself so cheap. Perhaps. But the king makes it possible for me to spend my life exploring the heavens. What could be better? From now on, it is all astronomy. And now that I am an astronomer, you will be an astronomer too. I will? Yes. You see? I built a telescope for you. It's your size. Mm. What a nice toy. Thank you, brother. No, Caroline. It's small, but it's not a toy. It is the best telescope ever made for finding comets. The telescopes I use are bigger, but they are not nearly as good for discovering comets. Your comet seeker can see a region 50 times greater than the moon covers in the sky and can see it with utmost clarity. If a comet comes our way, and if you slowly, carefully sweep the skies as I do, you will find it, most likely before anyone else. So each night I set up my midget telescope alongside William's giant telescope, and we observed together. And, and it was fun. As I was searching for comets, I found hazy objects that looked like <coughs> comets. William told me they were called nebulas. I found so many new nebulas so quickly 
that William decided to make a survey of the entire sky that could be seen from Windsor to find all the nebulas possible and to try to figure out what these fuzzy patches of light were. So he built a new reflecting telescope that was 20 feet long and had an 18 inch mirror. And he went nebula hunting. I would set up my comet sweeper nearby so that I could bring strange new objects to his attention immediately. This isn't working at all. Your new telescope isn't working? No, it's working brilliantly. As the Earth turns, sometimes a dozen nebulas drift into my field of view in a minute's time. That's the problem. Every time I see something new, I need to write it down. So I have to take my eye off the sky, like a lamp, and write it down. But the light destroys my night vision. I can't see faint objects like nebulas again for several minutes. And in those several minutes, who knows what objects may have escaped me. This is no good. And what can you do? What I need to do is keep my eye in the eyepiece, not lose sight of the sky for a moment. And any time I see a new nebula, I would call off its position to someone who would write it down. <laughs> I could do that. But then you would lose your night vision and lose your comets. You would do that? Oh, Lina, this is an important project. What a difference it would make if you recorded what I saw. I mean, until now, there were about a hundred of these nebulas known. Messier in France wrote down those, these hazy objects so he, he wouldn't get confused and think they were comets. I mean, comets were the prize. To him, the nebulas were a nuisance. But with my telescope, I'm seeing nebulas as he never saw before. Every night, there will turn out to be hundreds more nebulas than Messier thought. No, more than that, thousands. To me, they are not a nuisance. I'm sure they can tell us something important about the universe. I will take notes for you. That would solve the problem. You're very accurate. If it would be useful, I will do it. Good, Caroline. William's search for nebulas would last for 20 years. When he began, the world knew of the 100 nebulas and star clusters that Messier had found. When my brother finished his survey, the world knew of 2,500 nebulas and star clusters. So now my life was totally different from when I was a musician. On all clear nights and partly cloudy nights and almost overcast nights, I would sit by the open window and my brother would call out the positions of the nebulas and other objects he was discovering. The next morning, much too early for me, I would copy all the observations my brother made the night before into special books by category so that he could analyze them. Then I would copy out William's own scientific articles for publication and that was my schedule up till noon. Lina, I have finished this paper. I've discovered that the sun is not fixed among the stars. Instead, the sun and its planets are in motion, moving through the heavens towards certain stars and away from others. Would you please make a fresh copy and send it to the Royal Society for reading and publication? Yes, of course. Uh, before I send it, you will read through it to make certain I've made no mistakes. No, it's not necessary. You never make mistakes in your copying or in your mathematical calculations. The motion of the sun among the stars was just one in a series of amazing discoveries made by William Herschel, assisted by Caroline. Next, he discovered the sun's place in the Milky Way. When we see the Milky Way encircling the sky, it looks like we are at the center. But Herschel showed we aren't. Then Herschel compared the shape of the Milky Way in the sky with the nebulas he was discovering. Our Milky Way is long and thin as seen from the side. Some of these nebulas are long and thin. Maybe they are like the Milky Way seen sideways. If we look at our Milky Way from the top, it should look rather round and flat with a bulge in the middle. You see, some of these nebulas look that way. So I think some of these nebulas are island universes like our Milky Way, floating in the immensity of space. I cannot conceive of such vastness. And some of those island universes must be larger than our Milky Way. So many stars. You know the bright star Sirius? 
as astronomers have estimated its distance from Earth about a million times farther than the Sun. That means the rays of light we see from Sirius tonight started toward us about nine years ago. But Sirius is a nearby star. The nebulas I see are so dim that the light from their stars must have started on its way to us two million years ago and more. Two million years? Do you realize what that means, Caroline? Many of the nebulas we see have been in existence more than two million years. Our universe is millions of years old. And when we look deep into the universe, we're looking backward in time, millions of years. William, you must be very careful when you say such things. In the Bible, the generations add up to only 6,000 years. Yet the universe proclaims millions of years. And surely out there in those other collections of millions of stars, there must be other beings, people living out there on those planets, <coughs> looking out at us as we are looking at them. And the sight they see is probably much like what we see from Earth. They see their island of stars from the inside when they look outward beyond their island. They see all these other island universes in our Milky Way drifting along through the blackness of space. When you say it, it's almost like music. It's better than any music I ever composed. One summer, William went to Germany on an errand for the king to deliver one of his telescopes to an observatory there. During the days, I managed the household as usual and handled correspondence and showed visitors William's giant telescopes. I wrote out papers William wanted to publish. But at night, it was a strange feeling. The great 20-foot telescope stood unused. No one called out to me the positions of nebulas and star clusters as they were being discovered at that very moment. At night, I had nothing else to do but mind the heavens by myself. I did so with the little telescope that my brother made for me. And I discovered what I thought was a comet. The next night, I saw it again, and it had moved against the background of stars. It was in our solar system. It was a comet. I was so excited that I stayed up all night writing a letter to the Royal Society in London and another to Alexander Albert to announce the comet. Mr. Albert responded quickly. I still have the letter. I am more pleased than you can imagine that you have made this discovery. When your brother hears the news, he will shed a tear of joy for you. You have immortalized your name by your dedication to astronomy. Charles Blagden, the secretary of the Royal Society, wrote me even sooner. He believes I am the first person to see this comet and report it. Me. Now here's the biggest surprise. He and the president of the Royal Society asked if they might come from London all the way here to see the comet through my telescope, even though William was away. The next day they were here. We observed the comet together. When William came home, the king summoned him to court to show the comet to the royal family. Fanny Burney, the novelist, was there. She said the comet was very small with nothing grand or striking in its appearance. But she said she was very eager to see it because it was the first comet discovered by a woman. Lina, the king has granted my request. He will give me 2,000 pounds to build a 40-foot telescope, a focal length of 40 feet with a 48-inch mirror. The world has never seen anything like it. The largest telescope mirror in the world right now is my 18-inch. It has been my dream ever since I began building telescopes. Our house lay along the road from Bath to London, so coaches were passing all the time. Even before the telescope was complete, the coaches would stop so that passengers could step outside and gape at the giant. William's 40-foot tall telescope became a tourist attraction. And not just for passers-by, the king and queen brought their visitors to see the telescope. Astronomers from all over Europe came to see it too. Lina, the king has approved the extra 2,000 pounds to complete the 40-foot telescope, and his majesty has granted my other requests as well. He will give me 200 pounds a year to maintain it. And Caroline, he will give you 50 pounds a year to be my assistant. Mm -hmm. 50 pounds. It was the first money I ever received for my work. It was the first money I ever had in all my lifetime to, and been at liberty to spend as I wished. For many years, I was manager of my brother's money, and he had always told me to take whatever I wanted for myself and just mark for Caroline in the ledger. But I never took out more than seven or eight pounds a year, and now I will have 50 pounds a year, each year for the rest of my life. Mm. Caroline, I've been to see our neighbor, Mary Pitts, 
who I would have liked to visit her too. She and her husband were such good company. Those dinners at their house and the times they came here. All those discussions you had with John after dinner on cloudy nights. It's been, what, a year now since John died? How is she doing? I haven't seen her in weeks. Well, she misses John deeply. But I think her spirits are reviving. She will find the strength to go on with life. I know you must be a great comfort to her. And so are you, Caroline. Well, perhaps I was in the first few months, but I haven't been along when you've gone to visit her lately. Caroline, I have asked Mary to be my wife. What? And she has accepted. But you're almost 50 years old. You've always been single. You've courted no one since you brought me here from Germany. I've never met a woman like Mary. I've been single too long. But what will happen to your astronomy? She knows that I cannot give up astronomy. All she asks is that I cut back on the hours I work and that I take a vacation at least once a year with her. And she will be the manager of this household? Yes, of course. That'll be one less burden for you. Well, what about me, William? Burden? Is that what you think? I've been thinking about that, Lina. You shall have a pension from Mary and me for the rest of your life. We will make sure that you're comfortable. You can marry her for your money, for her money if you want. I don't want her money or yours. I won't take it. Sixteen years I've been at your side doing everything you needed done. You needed someone to manage your house, I learned how to do it. You needed a singer, I became a singer. Perhaps I could have had a singing career and earned money of my own, but you needed a telescope maker, so I became a telescope maker. Then you needed an assistant astronomer and a mathematician and a catalog maker, and now I'll be a neighbor who might be invited for tea, occasionally. I don't want your charity. Mary doesn't know astronomy, Caroline. She doesn't know how to use a telescope or how to make the calculations for a catalog or how to write a report for publications on my discoveries. She can't replace you as my assistant. <laughs> Caroline, I am so happy. I hope you'll understand. Yes, William, I understand. You are always changing in your career, in your ideas, in what you love and whom you love. It's easy for you. And you sweep along those around you with your brilliance and your enthusiasm. But I don't want to change. I was happy with the, things, the, way, the way things were. But I am swept along anyway like so much dust. I wrote horrible things in my diary. Later, I was ashamed of what I had written. So I destroyed nine years of my diary burned it up so no one would ever know. My brother was always building larger and larger telescopes to see more of the universe. William's world was always expanding. And now mine was shrinking. After my brother married, he didn't stay up all night at the telescope as much as he used to. I had more time of my own, more time for myself, just when I didn't want spare time. So I kept busy at night searching for comets. Just before Christmas, 1788, I caught my second comet. That was my Christmas present to myself. In 1790, in a three-month period, I ambushed my third and fourth comets. I was so famous that a cartoonist drew a cartoon about me. It's rather indelicate, but I enjoyed it. Here it is. See, there I am discovering my third comet. The title of the cartoon is The Female Philosopher Smelling Out the Comet. It shows me with the wrong kind of telescope, of course, and that's quite an unusual comet I'm discovering. The head of the comet has a child in it, <laughs> And look at the tail of that comet. I bet you've never seen one like that. The tail is made of vapors coming out of the rear end of the child. <laughs> the cartoonist has me saying, what a strong sulfurous scent proceeds from the meteor. See, apparently I discovered a meteor, not a comet. And apparently <laughs> I discovered comets not by seeing them with my telescope, but by smelling their stench. Mm. Hmm. Still, I like this cartoon a lot. The way it was drawn, look at me. I wish I ever looked that good. Letters from scientists all over England and Europe came to me and William, praising my comet discoveries. One called me a priestess of the heavens. Priestess. One astronomer said he was proud to have me as a sister astronomer. Some letters called, letters called me the celebrated Miss Caroline. You know, Caroline, I have never discovered a comet. Jérôme de Lalande in Paris addressed one of his letters to me as Mademoiselle Caroline Herschel, distinguished astronomer at Windsor. Nothing more. And the postman brought it just the same. Jerome made two visits here, you know, and we had lots of time to talk. 
After a night of stargazing with William and me, he wrote, I've memorized it, I tell everybody I meet that I've never ever passed such an agreeable evening, and that includes even nights spent in making love. Well, he's a Frenchman. <laughs> he always referred to me as that brilliant young lady. He wrote that he told people about me all the time. In one letter, he sent a thousand tender respects to that brilliant young lady. But he never sent himself again. Well, altogether, I discovered eight comets. And then, to my astonishment, four years after my brother married, my sister-in-law gave birth to a baby boy. They named him John, and I became Aunt Caroline. John was their only child, but I felt like he was mine, too. When he could barely walk, I started showing him my little telescope. I taught him arithmetic. I tried to teach him all the things my mother didn't want me to learn, things my father tried to teach me when my mother wasn't looking. I wanted him to have ambitions for himself. I remember August 14th, 1797. I always begin the evening looking at the sky with just my eyes to see if anything strange presents itself. Nothing ever had, but at this time it did. I couldn't believe it. I could see a comet. William was away, but my brother Alexander was visiting, so I ran to get him so that he could stand by while I examined the comet through my telescope and called off the position information to him to write down and record the time on the clock so that it wouldn't interfere with my night vision. There was no time to lose. Excuse me, miss. I am Lord Storker, here to see Mr. Herschel. He said I might drop by any time to see his telescope. Well, excuse me, my lord, but my brother William is away. That's all right. He said that if he wasn't here, his sister would be happy to show me the telescopes. Lord Storker, I am that sister, but this is not a good time. I've just this moment discovered a comet. I must get my brother Alexander to help me make, make notes, and then I must not notify the Astronomer Royal and the Royal Society. The Royal Society has been without knowledge of this comet for the entirety of its existence. Surely a few hours will not hurt while you show me the great 40-foot telescope. Only my brother William observes with that telescope. The best I can offer you is for my brother Alexander to walk around the telescope with you and explain it. Meanwhile, if you wait until I get Alexander, I will let you look through my telescope at the comet. It's quite remarkable. Look, there in the sky. You can even see it without a telescope. Most comets are never visible to the naked eye. Where? See that bright star just above the southwestern horizon? Look about one hand up from that star and a bit to the right. I don't see it. Oh, yes, there it is. Oh, that is your comet. Yes, my lord. Yes, well, I will disturb you no further. Uh, please tell your brother that I stopped by to see his telescopes. Alexander and I worked through the night. I had to get word to the Astronomer Royal at Greenwich as quickly as possible so that he could confirm the comet and transmit the news to astronomers here in England and all over Europe. But our mail service is slow and our English weather is undependable. By the time my letter arrived, it could be cloudy for days. No, I decided I must go myself. So I rested for an hour until dawn. Then I saddled a horse and rode 27 miles to London, and then another six miles to the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, though I had never ridden, before ridden a horse more than two miles. Mm. My long ride allowed Do Dr. Maskeline to confirm the comet that very night. It was the eighth comet I had discovered. It was my last. How fast those years passed. How I wished time would stand still. My brother was 60 now, then 70. His health was declining, and we observed the heavens less and less. William, the skies are clear. Shall we observe tonight? No, not tonight, Lina. I just don't have the energy to stay up all night and brave the weather like I used to. Besides, because of you, I have records of observations that will last me for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm more and more content to put those observations together and see what they mean. No more observing? Oh, some, certainly. And you shall be at my side just as you have always been. But, Lina, I've been thinking a lot about the observations I've already made. And do you know what they show? How stars are formed. I realize now that not all the nebulas are star systems. Some are made of gas. That great nebula in the constellation Orion looks like a fiery mist. It must be the chaotic material from which other suns are forming. Stars must be born in such gas clouds. 
those gaseous nebulas I have seen all over the sky, here and there, where the density is greater. Gravity causes that portion of the nebula to contract, to squeeze down into a star that shines. In that nebula, one by one, stars are formed. By gravity, the new stars may hold one together as they go traveling through space as cluster of stars. So the star clusters we see today were once giant clouds of gas. Gravity transforms a gaseous nebula into a cluster of stars. That's almost too simple to be true. I know. That's what makes it all the more exciting. All the more beautiful. That's a great discovery, William. You must keep going. You must keep observing. Well, I'm old, Lina. The days crept by, one day like another. The weeks, the months. I organized William's papers, but there was no observing to be done. I had nothing to do but watch my brother's life ebbing away. Then one day, William sent word to me at my apartment. Lina, there's a great comet. <clears throat> Lina, there's a great comet. I want you to assist me. Come to dine and spend the day here. If you can come soon after one o'clock, we shall have time to prepare maps and telescopes. I saw the comet last night. It has a long tail. It has a long tail. I keep this note as a relic. Now every line traced by the hand of my dear brother becomes a treasure to me. We did not observe together again. And now, I have nothing more to do in this world. William brought me to England when I was 22. Fifty years had passed. Mary has been a good wife to him. I love her and my nephew John, but I could not remain at Windsor after William died. Everywhere I looked, the memories overwhelmed me. I moved back to Hanover to be with my younger brother. And yet, I did not die. Astronomers and scientists from England and all over the continent stopped by to see me. Gauss, Humboldt, and best of all, my nephew John came to see me three times over the years. Margaret, I've been to see Aunt Caroline. She is weary and dull in the morning, but in the afternoon she runs all over town. <laughs> she attends concerts and plays and is quite a celebrity in Hanover. Whenever she attends an event, the newspapers always mention that she was there at home in the evening. She sings, dances, even puts her foot behind her head. She bounds up two flights of stairs to her apartment. I can scarcely keep up. She has more energy than people a quarter her age. I will say goodbye to her this afternoon. John, your father was unique in the history of astronomy. In astronomy, there are instrument makers, there are observers, and there are theorists. Only William Herschel was all three, and the best in the world in each category. It never happened before, and I suspect it will never happen again. And this from a man who never went to college. In fact, he never went to high school. He was a musician. He taught himself astronomy, and he didn't start observing until he was 40 years old. Without you, Aunt Caroline, it would not have been possible. Nonsense. I did nothing for your father that a well-trained puppy dog couldn't have done. <laughs> I know he didn't see you that way. He... He revolutionized astronomy, but without you, he could have accomplished only a fraction of what he did. Your perseverance was beyond all measure, your, your selflessness, going to the very limits of human understanding. No one has ever had a better partner than you in his work. Partner is too grand a description. Assistant, maybe. You helped to educate me, too. I only entertained you with some science and mathematics when you were small and your father was busy. And when I was trying to complete my father's work in England by making a new survey of the heavens, you prepared a special catalog for me that saved me months of observing, maybe years. All the thousands of nebulas and star clusters and double stars in the order that they would appear in my telescope? It's nothing. Just what I used to do for your father. Well, 
the Royal Astronomical Society thought it was something. They gave you their gold medal. And Aunt Caroline, do you realize that when you announced the discovery of your comets in the philosophical transactions, you became the first woman ever to publish an article about her discoveries in the Science Journal of the Royal Society? What gives me most pleasure is that you will soon be off to Cape Town in South Africa to extend your father's work to the southern skies not visible from England. How proud that would make him. Who knows what wonders you will find. Farewell, John. May you have great success in South Africa. Be sure to write me about your discoveries and adventures. And when you return, come visit me again if you can. And so I have lived on in Hanover, through my 70s, into my 80s, now into my 90s. The buildings around my apartment are too high for me to set up my telescope and sweep the heavens for comets. No matter. It has taken half a century for other astronomers to catch up to where my brother was. I read that William Parsons in Ireland has built a telescope larger than William's 40 foot. I read that Bessel and others have finally measured parallax, have calculated the distance to a few nearby stars as William always hoped to do. I hear that Uranus, the Georgian planet, is not following the orbit it should, as if something is pulling on it. Some mathematicians and astronomers think the irregular motion of a Uranus may point them to an unknown planet still farther from the sun, an eighth planet. I don't know. I just know it was William who showed them the way, my brother. I live now in those memories. Well, thank you for coming. I fear I've talked your ears off. And thank you so much for the award you have given me. You see, I never forget the caution my dear father gave me against all thought of marriage, saying as I was neither handsome nor rich, it was not likely that anyone would propose to me despite my good qualities. Instead, I could perhaps find a way to make myself useful. Perhaps. Thank mm -hmm. you.